We are going to get started this hour with the escalating tensions and breaking news from Israel. The Israeli Defense Forces say they have finished their probe into the fatal attack on a World Central Kitchen convoy. According to the statement just released, Israeli forces mistakenly identified people in the convoy as Hamas militants. Officials say they did not have enough evidence to justify the airstrike. Seven members of World Central Kitchen were killed as a result. Now, this comes after President Biden issued a stern warning in a phone call with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu yesterday, threatening that the U.S. would pull its military aid to Israel if it does not immediately address the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Secretary of State Antony Blinken had this to say right after that call. The president emphasized that the strikes on humanitarian workers and the overall humanitarian situation are unacceptable. He made clear the need for Israel to announce a series of specific, concrete, and measurable steps to address civilian harm, humanitarian suffering, and the safety of aid workers. The call comes just days ahead of April 7th, which will mark six months since Hamas attacked Israel, the start of the war. About 1,200 people in Israel were killed that day, with about 240 kidnapped. Gaza's health ministry says since October 7th, more than 33,000 people have died there. We have NBC News international correspondent Megan Fitzgerald and NBC News White House correspondent Ali Rafa joining us with the latest developments. Megan, let's get right to that breaking news. We're learning new information this morning about the Israeli investigation into the attack on the World Central Kitchen members. The IDF saying it finished its probe already. What are they saying? And do we have any response yet from World Central Kitchen? Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, just moments ago, the IDF released a statement detailing their investigation into the incident, which said uh, the findings were presented to World Central Kitchen. So here's what we know. Uh, the IDF says their forces identified a gunman on one of the aid trucks, one of the aid vehicles, and then identified an additional gunman. Uh, now, after the vehicles left the warehouse where the aid had been unloaded, one of the commanders mistakenly assumed that Hamas operatives were in the vehicle uh, and that they didn't know that these vehicles were from World Central Kitchen. The IDF is calling this a grave mistake, stemming from a serious failure, and they ended up dismissing two high-ranking commanders on the ground there. Uh, we are also hearing from World Central Kitchen, who says it's clear from this preliminary investigation that the IDF has deployed deadly force without regard to its own protocols, chain of command, and rules of engagement. Uh, the statement went on to say uh, that they're demanding the creation of an independent commission to investigate the killings of their colleagues. Uh, but look, you know, there's really no doubt about it. International condemnation is quickly growing. Israel's staunchest allies have denounced the killings and had called for a thorough and efficient investigation. Uh, the EU called for accountability and public opinion on the way in which Israel is carrying out this war just continues to drastically shift around the world as more and more innocent lives uh, are taken during this war. Guys, Ali, let's bring you in here and talk about the tension that this is creating between one of those allies, us, the United States. Let's talk about the phone call between President Biden and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. How is the White House trying to pressure Israel into improving the situation in Gaza and how's Israel responding? Yeah, guys, good morning. Well, the stakes of this roughly 30-minute call between these two leaders really could not be underscored enough. This was the first time that these two had spoken in nearly three weeks. And we know that on this call, President Biden warned Prime Minister Netanyahu that without immediate action taken to protect civilians in Gaza, to address the dire humanitarian concerns there, uh, and to address an immediate ceasefire in Gaza amid Israel's war with Hamas, uh, that U.S. policy towards its ally could change. The White House saying that it needed to see those changes implemented within hours or days. It also didn't specify how U.S. policy towards Israel could change. But a U.S. official tells NBC News uh, that the president on this phone call with Netanyahu strongly implied that he may condition U.S. military aid to Israel if the country didn't take these steps, uh, that the White House says that they will assess and make a determination uh, off of those steps by the Israelis. And that pressure seemed to uh, 
have uh, worked in the immediate uh, in the immediate term. We saw overnight, uh, uh, in the middle of the night, Israeli time, the Israeli government announced the opening of another border crossing in the north, uh, announced the uh, the ramping up of more humanitarian aid going in from Jordan, uh, as well as another border crossing, guys. All right, Megan, so as we take stock at nearly six months into the conflict, what is the latest on the situation on the ground in Gaza? Joe, right now that death toll in Gaza, according to Gaza's health ministry, has surpassed 33,000 and nearly 76,000 injured. Uh, the ministry continues to say that the majority of these deaths are women and children. You know, I've been speaking to humanitarian aid organizations for weeks now. Uh, they've been saying what really stands out is that they continue to say that the situation on the ground in Gaza can't get any worse. They've stopped saying that now because the situation always does. The enclave is teetering on the brink of famine, uh, and you've got humanitarian aid organizations organizations like World Central Kitchen that are temporarily suspending their operations because of the concern uh, for the men and women who are risking their lives to try and deliver much needed aid, Joe. All right, Megan Fitzgerald, Ali Raff, a lot to cover this morning. Thank you both. Nearly six months into the war, talks between Israel and Hamas over further prisoner and hostage exchange remain stalled. While the Biden administration puts more pressure on both sides to come to some kind of a deal, the strain on the families of the hostages has taken a huge toll. NBC News's Digital Docs team spoke to Rachel Goldberg Poland. Her son Hirsch is one of the hostages in Gaza. She's become a major voice in the effort to free the hostages, trying to live her life day by day, yet haunted by the daily burden of a missing child. I've had episodes where I do break. It's better when I know that it's coming and I can, you know, say, I'll be right back and, you know, go to my room or go to the bathroom or go somewhere where it's not so public. But that's not the way trauma works. So there are definitely times where I'm out there screaming or crying or laying on the street. I'm also extremely heartbroken over the unbelievable suffering of hundreds of thousands of innocent Gazan people, what they are going through. It's unbearable and so painful to watch. Right now, there are hundreds of thousands of people suffering in this on both sides. And it's time for the suffering to stop. You can watch that documentary, Stolen Son, now on NBCNews.com by scanning the QR code on your screen right there. Mm, some incredibly powerful reporting from our colleagues. Let's turn now to former President Donald Trump's legal drama. A federal judge is denying a motion to dismiss his Mar-a-Lago classified documents case. So Judge Aileen Cannon rejected Trump's lawyer's arguments that the documents were considered personal under the Presidential Records Act. The former president is facing numerous charges in the case, including willful retention of national defense information and conspiracy to obstruct justice. Trump has pleaded not guilty to all counts. Over in Georgia, a judge rejected a bid by Trump's legal team to dismiss the state's election interference case on free speech grounds. Trump and 14 other defendants in that case have pleaded not guilty. We've got NBC News Now legal analyst Angela Senadella helping us out this Friday morning. Angela, thanks as always for being here. So first, let's start on the classified documents case. Help us just understand the Presidential Records Act exactly and, and why it is that the judge would have rejected this idea that they were these personal documents. Documents. Right. So the judge didn't necessarily reject it entirely. It's still a defense that his team can raise throughout the course of the trial. But this was regarding a motion to dismiss. And that's a really high bar. It has nothing to do with even the factual allegations of the case. The judge has to actually believe everything the prosecutor has said in determining whether or not this motion to dismiss should be approved or denied. But it's really a question of did the prosecutors make a huge mistake in the legal standard in bringing these charges? And what the judge noted here is that the prosecutors didn't even mention the Presidential Records Act, actually has nothing to even do with it with regards to these charges. So that's why she said that motion to dismiss will not survive here. But in the future, perhaps if you want to bring it up, you can through other pretrial motions or throughout the course
course of the trial itself. Hard to believe this trial was initially scheduled to start May 20th, which would be next month. That's not happening. We know both sides have proposed new dates. The judge has not made a decision yet. What are the odds this is actually going to happen before the November election? What are some of the challenges that could prevent it from happening before the election? So this one in particular, it is very unlikely that this will happen before the election. And that's because it is a classified documents case. And judges in general have limited experience with classified documents cases. Now, you might think, well, whatever, a judge could just proceed anyway. But she has to make decisions on every piece of evidence, on every piece of documentation to see even what the prosecuting team or the defense should see, should should consider. So it's it's a long haul. Let's now turn to the election interference case in Georgia. So explain to us, I know the judge there dismissed, the, dismissed this idea that they could dismiss the charges on First Amendment grounds. Explain that to us. Yes, so the Georgia case, as you know, is an election interference case. So Trump's team was arguing that all of Trump's statements that he's being prosecuted for are political speech. And you know, political discourse between different people of different beliefs is obviously protected speech under the First Amendment. But the prosecutors and the judge here decided, no, there is a difference between political discourse, political speech, and then speech that's being used in the furtherance of an alleged criminal act. As you know, when you make a false statement to, for example, a government official, that can be criminalized. It's not that all speech itself is just protected mm. because we're talking about an election here. But again, just like in the Florida case, that could possibly be a defense he raises again in the future. It's just it didn't survive that motion to dismiss. It's not the prosecutors made some massive mistake and thus all the charges just walk away. Hmm. Angela, as always, we appreciate you. Thank you. All right, we're getting closer. Monday's the day. Tens of millions of Americans have been waiting for that total solar eclipse will make its way across the country, casting a 115 mile wide path of darkness over parts of the U.S. in the middle of the afternoon. And scientists say we won't have another total eclipse here for another 20 years. So how can you make the most of this one? So for a few ideas, let's bring in Professor Savik Ford. She teaches astronomy at the City University of New York and joins us now to talk all things eclipse. Good to have you with us, Dr. Ford. We know people in the direct path, they're going to experience that total eclipse. But what about a lot of the yeah. other countries, yeah. outlying areas, Colorado, Florida? What Here. will those folks be able to see? Well, um, it's going to actually be pretty exciting no matter where you are. Even a partial solar eclipse is pretty impressive. And so we've got a lot of options when you go there. Obviously, Hopefully people have bought their uh, eclipse glasses or often there are places that you can get them if there's going to be an event near you. A lot of nonprofits are handing them out in New York. You can go to your local public library and pick up a free pair. Um, and so when you're lucky enough to be in the path of totality, you don't actually need those glasses during totality, but you do need it for the rest of the time, which is most of the time that this is going to take up. And for the rest of us who are going to be in some kind of partial eclipse the whole time, you can look through your glasses, but if you didn't get them or you're just forgotten where you put them on the day, you can just pull out your handy dandy colander that you Ooh, might be using what? for your uh, for your for your spaghetti that night. And so this is going to do double duty. All these little holes in your colander are going to create a shadow on the ground. But when the sun is being partially eclipsed, they're not going to be circular shadows. Or uh, You're actually going to be able to see the shape of the moon eating into the sun. And so you can just hold this up and then you know look behind you on the ground at the shadow. And you can see how the eclipse is progressing. And you can do that with anything that makes like a little hole. But the colander is kind of handy. So. And, and then make um, pasta for dinner. Yeah. Okay, so that's a good one. No, don't look through that at the sun, to be clear. Right. But just like hold it up and look at a shadow. Yeah. And also yes, make sure you're not getting knockoff glasses. I've been hearing about a lot of people where we're not sure if they're legitimate ones. So um, tell yeah. us, though, I, we want to like learn a little bit here from you about how this all works. Because as I said, we're not going to have another one of these for 20 years in the U.S. It's, it's this total solar eclipse is going to be in 2044. But then what I think is kind of interesting is that then it's again in 2045. So right after. Help us understand this. Like the Earth and the moon, they're constantly traveling around the sun. Why does it seem like these happen at such random, infrequent intervals? And how accurate are these predictions 20, 21 years out? So that's a great question. Basically, as probably people have heard at this point, a total eclipse happens because the moon gets between the sun and the Earth at just the right distance. And this is a great diagram. The moon orbits the Earth at a tilt. And so as the moon sort of 
wobbles around on that tilted orbit, sometimes it passes between the Earth and the Sun precisely to create a, an eclipse, and sometimes it doesn't. And it only does that for a very short period of time, and it only does that from a very particular perspective on the Earth. And so we actually get eclipses once or twice a year, total solar eclipses, but 70% of the Earth's surface is water. So most of the time, it's somewhere in the middle of the ocean, and you're going to have to take a boat if you want to go see it. And there are people who do that, by the way, like every time. <laughs> um, but if you're going to stay in one place, you're going to be like, okay, it has to happen in the United States. Well, you know, we're on this very particular spot. And so sometimes you get lucky, and most of the time, you don't. So the next time we're going to get lucky, there's going to be a little chunk of the northern near the Canadian border in 2044. And then there's going to be a good uh, eclipse very similar to this one again in 2045. And it's just sort of coincidence. You know, many people may remember we had another one like this back in 2017. And so it's just sort of luck of the draw a little bit. Um, but we're really good at predicting eclipses, honestly. Um, we can go back 5,000 years. We can go forwards 5,000 years. There's like books written up and it's, <laughs> it's pretty straightforward. It's pretty cool. Professor Ford, you're involved in several projects that make science more accessible to the public. Can you give us like one example of a simple experiment the average person can do during the eclipse? I love that. Uh, so one that actually I just learned about, um, which is kind of cool and very easy, is that your color perception changes during the eclipse. So uh, you might notice this yourself sometimes in low light, colors look kind of not right uh, or not what you're expecting, not what you know them to be. And so if you're lucky enough to be in the path of the total solar eclipse, when the light levels drop, your color perception of red and green actually changes. So your, your red color perception is less good in that low light and your green color perception is 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 not bad and so if you've got some people you know, you've got a friend wearing a red t-shirt another friend wearing a green t-shirt <laughs> you kind of look at them in totality you know you can you can see that you can see that change happen so that's kind of fun It'd be like that whole dress controversy all over again yeah. all right dr <laughs> exactly. that was fun. thank you so much that appreciate your out. time <laughs> i was always a flipper on that one <laughs> all right speaking of the eclipse we want to bring you an update on a story we first brought you earlier in the week six inmates in upstate new york will be allowed to watch the eclipse after winning a legal battle with the state's department of corrections the men filed a lawsuit saying that a prison lockdown on Monday, the day of the eclipse, would violate their constitutional right to practice their religion. And while they come from different religious backgrounds, the inmates each argued that they must witness and reflect on the rare solar event to practice their faith. Inmates in other state prisons will also be allowed to request permission to watch the eclipse for religious reasons. However, a statewide prison lockdown will remain in place. Both the east and west coast will see some wet weather, even some snow as we head into the weekend. So for more details on that and where to get the best view of the eclipse come Monday, Angie has the eclipse forecast, which has got to be fun for you. Yeah. Oh, a delight, a true delight, guys. <laughs> Nothing riding on a, you know, a forecast on Monday, right? Uh, good morning to you. We've got a, a couple of spots to talk about, and then I promise I will get you that eclipse forecast. But as you guys mentioned, a couple of areas that we're dealing with a little snow and a little rain, and they're on each end of the coast. We've still got kind of this pesky low that has just hung around near the coast of Maine. It's leaving us with the, the snow showers still in the vicinity. Nothing like what we've been dealing with over the past couple of days, but those will remain in the picture for the day today. Middle of the country, you look great. We've got some clear skies. We're going to see some mild temperatures there. Out west, that's where we're tracking our next storm system that's going to work across the country in the coming days and even bring us a couple of potentials for some stronger storms. So let's time that out for you. Here's the system we're watching today. The showers across parts of California. We've got some snow and some rain across the northwest. We'll see this system work into portions of the Rockies here and into the center of the country by tomorrow. That means heavy snow, even some winds across parts of the northern Rockies. That'll make travel difficult in that region. But this is the line of thunderstorms that I'm watching for tomorrow across the central plains. We could see those become strong. We likely will see uh, the potential for some hail, some damaging winds. And not to mention, we've got uh, plenty of rain in the forecast over the next couple of days. And on top of that, that snow from that same system topping about six inches to 12 
12 inches for more widespread areas, but of course those highest peaks could get up to 18 inches by the time it's all said and done. If you have outdoor plans in this region for tomorrow, uh, places like North Platte to Omaha and down to Tulsa, you're going to want to make sure that you have a way to get alerts because again, the chance for some of those stronger storms is there. The hail and the wind are the biggest threats, but we can't rule out those tornadoes. Big picture look across the country for your Saturday. It'll be better across the Northeast. We'll still have a couple of these lingering snow showers and breezy and on the cool side of things, honestly, the Southeast looks great. Plenty of sunshine there. There's those strong storms that I mentioned. California will finally start to dry out as we get into tomorrow. And then that system continues to be on the move and we'll watch for some stronger storms stretching from the Midwest down to parts of the South. That is one of the spots that we'll watch uh, to be a little unsettled here. And here's what you've been waiting for, right? That forecast as far as your eclipse is concerned. That This, what you see right here, of course, is the uh, path of totality where you see uh, the brighter blues, that's less cloud cover. That's clear skies, just like a blue sky. Where you see the gray, that's of course the cloudy conditions. So the big picture look, New Mexico to Midwest, mostly sunny skies. The Northeast will also be nice and sunny. And along the Gulf Coast, that's where kind of the bad news is. I got to be honest, guys, storms and gray skies will be there. And I feel a little left out right now. You'll see why in a second. We've got plenty of coverage across parts of the South. And uh, that's where we're dealing with the cloud cover, guys, and the rain chances. Indianapolis looks great. Even the Northeast looks pretty good if you can get into totality. Places like Brockport, New York deal with some uh, cloud cover, but uh, where our friend Kate Snow will be, just 10% cloud cover wow, and clear sky, so a great spot in Maine. This is you, right? <laughs> I'm over here, Joe. It's me, <laughs> it's really dark. It's so dark. It's so These really, these no, really are dark, aren't they? Yeah. It's, if you look up at our studio lights, so that's when you can see a little coming oh, through. Don't look like, into oh, the light. No. With I'm, these, you can. Yeah, with those, you, you can. can. But so. don't, not through a pasta strainer. I feel oh, right, gosh. right. That was like a behind you thing, <laughs> yeah, right? So yeah, I'm like, Make, Thank you for clarifying. blind, everyone. Yeah. You see me with a colony? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Angie, I know people are going to come for you when they oh don't see the clip, so we're thinking of you. It's not Thanks. my fault. It's not, not my fault. fault. Thank you, PSA. Angie. And NBC News now is going to be providing live coverage, of course, of the solar eclipse during a special report on Monday. It starts at 2 p.m. Eastern from one end of the path of totality all the way to the other. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.